Good morning, Mr. Hoffman. It's a pleasure to uh, see you, to meet you uh, this morning on our program. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, we are very privileged to have you here. Um, you and your fellow journalists have written a series of editorials on how to fight for democracy against autocracy. You've documented victims across the globe and achieved archive them in the Annals of Democracy, uh, and we can find them all uh, in the page of uh, the Washington Post editorial page. Uh, before I uh, begin uh, uh, introducing who you are, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, bring this up uh, a little bit. Uh, can you share with our viewers your knowledge of how autocrats treat their citizen? Is one country different from the other? Yeah, you know, they're all uh, quite uh, distinctive and unique, of course, but there's certain things they have in common. Uh, first of all, a democracy requires that people compete to show yeah. off their different ideas, to ask the people for legitimacy to run the government and to to govern. But in autocracy, this competition is denied. It's extinguished. Whether you're in Soviet Union or today's China or any uh, Cuba or Belarus, um, in all these places, people have no choice. That is the kernel, the very central tiny bit of genius in a democracy, this competition. When competition's extinguished and when it, voices are smothered and there's only one person in charge, yeah. that is the common feature of all autocracy. Okay. Uh, on your uh, December 21st uh, edition uh, opinion page, uh, you wrote, uh, you and your colleagues wrote, how the battle for democracy will be fought and won. Can you elaborate that a little bit for our viewers? One of the things that really interested me this year was how autocracies are beginning to use the internet and the digital revolution to modernize themselves, right? They are doing the same things that democracy advocates have done. They are, uh, uh, for example, using social media to arrest dissidents. People make one posting on Facebook or on Telegram and they get arrested. Yeah. People who uh, used the internet to reach back into their countries and express their views freely um, are often pursued. So one of the things that I discovered is that there are efforts being made in the United States and elsewhere to fight back. And a lot of this uh, is a fight back against firewalls, against censorship, um, against autocracy trying to smother the voices. So, for example, uh, there are efforts made to give people smooth, completely seamless uh, virtual private networks so they can uh, communicate through a firewall put up by a dictatorship. They, there are methods which I described using satellite technology, yeah. existing commercial satellite technology to give people free information about what's happening in the world. In other words, dictatorship cannot any longer seal off a whole country. Yeah. It's now impossible. Yes, you've noticed, uh, and everyone else has noticed, autocracy, authoritarianism, and dictatorship appear to be on the rise around the, the world uh, and determined to uh, challenge the concept of a free and democratic system. Do you think West, the Western world has to do more than it does now to alter the course? Oh, without question, it has to do more. Hassan, you know, democracy has been in retreat for 17 years now. And we have to ask the question, what is happening? Why are autocracies and dictatorships lasting so long? Why are they holding on to power for so long? And what's gone wrong with democracy? Well, you can see 
that one of the reasons that democracy is in retreat is simply that the authoritarian leaders have learned their methods and subverted them and undermined them. For example, the authoritarian leaders say, well, we're going to have a democratic election with only one candidate. Yeah. Well, that's not competition. That's yeah. not democracy. It's only fake democracy. So uh, authoritarian leaders have learned to use, instead of force in the streets and beating people up with batons when they protest, they've learned to arrest people for one single social media posting. Yeah. Um, in other words, to try and smother dissent even before it gets to protest. So that's uh, the argument I make, that the democracies need to f learn to fight back. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, but uh, Okay, before we get to how to fight back, uh, I'd like to continue with uh, my questions here. Many autocratic governments don't just punish dissidents at home. They try to exercise their long-arm tactics in a foreign land, harassing, intimidating, or even snatching this, uh, the critics off the street. Uh, do you know of any such foreign victims getting help from their host government? And what are the consequences, I mean, if that happened? Well, this is a very, very important question because it is happening in the United States an open society, yeah. in Britain an open society. In other words, democracies are finding that the dictators are reaching with their techniques into their open societies yeah. and carrying out their dictatorship methods of kidnapping, silencing, threatening. And I see it all over the world. In my article, the which I discussed this, I even, um, I mentioned your uh, host, uh, uh, Rada, and what yeah. happened to him. But also, for example, in the United States, we had an artist a Chinese artist who yeah. made a very big sculpture about Xi Jinping. Yeah. Uh, it was satirical sculpture, you know. Right. Satire means he was making fun a little bit and yeah. criticizing. And the, the Chinese agents, according to the our Justice Department, they tried to discredit him, and they burned down his sculpture. Here in, Here in America, yeah. yeah. I see. Okay. Um, Many autocratic uh, communist autocratic governments choose uh, a much less brazen approach, uh, uh, not to dispatch a hitman uh, to deal with their opponents abroad. Uh, they promise members of the diaspora community, uh, like the Cambodian Americans here in the U.S., uh, with benefits if they support the regime uh, back home. If they don't, their family members who remain behind may be in danger. By supporting, uh, the Cambodian Americans may violate the oath of allegiance to protect and defend the U.S. Constitution and the conditions of their citizen uh, status. Uh, what can our government do to allay such fears of retaliation in our community? It's a, good, it's a really good question. I don't have all the answers. Right. But, for example, we have something called the Foreign Agents Registration Act, Yeah. It's a very weak law that is basically just a registration law. Uh, Hassan, it's like a piece of paperwork. Yeah. And it says if you are an agent of Cambodia or of China or of Russia, then you must register. But a lot of times these people don't. So one thing that we could do would be to make this law more strict and make it more than just registration and enforce it more so that these kinds of people who go around making such threats will be somehow deterred or curbed. We could also, um, you know, if you harass somebody or kidnap them or steal or somehow hurt another American citizen, it's against our law. Well, we need to make it clear that if you're a foreigner and you come and harass people, you will also be prosecuted. And I think that the problem is that this has been kind of a gray zone because we're an open society uh, and we need to make it a little bit less gray and a little bit more black and white that yeah. any action against the laws of the United States that is aimed at diaspora will be prosecuted. 
urging Congress is one way to go, you think? Well, there are several bills in Congress. To be honest, Hassan, if you look closely at these bills, you'll see they don't have all the answers either. The bills say things like we ask for a one-year study or we ask the administration to prepare some ideas. So everybody is still a little bit trying to, uh, shall we say, discover yeah. a method. The bills are not clear, but Congress has several pieces of legislation that would begin the process of trying to get rid of this gray zone. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, ever tried to like uh, um, read the uh, Transnational uh, Repression Policy Act introduced uh, in May of last year by Senator Merkley? Right. This is what I'm talking uh, about. It doesn't okay. solve the problem. Right, it right. just least... asks for a strategy uh, to come up. I don't have the strategy either, yeah, but right. I see the need for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. With or without strategy to deal with all these problems. Uh, my other question is, some critics argue that the current U.S. policy uh, silently encourages autoc uh, autocracy because we accept as strategic, a strategic friend of an autocratic government that we know committing human rights abuses and destroying democracy. What do you make of it, Mr. Hallman? You know, Hassan, this is a long, deep, serious problem for the United States. Uh, after World War II, you know, the United Nations Declaration of Universal Declaration of Human Rights was approved in 1948, but right. to be honest with you, it didn't really become a major foreign policy concern of the United States until the 1970s, and only for the past 20 or 30 years has human rights been a major policy concern of our government, and even then, it's always been just one of several baskets of yeah. policy. We've had a government that had relations and negotiations with the Soviet Union, even at the time that they abused human rights. Um, yeah. Today, we talk with China, we have relations with China, we trade with China, even as we talk to them about abuses of human rights. So human rights is never the only thing going on. And yeah. I think everybody has to be realistic that it must never be ignored but it also isn't the only criteria. Right. You mentioned in your uh, piece uh, back in December uh, last year. Um, not that long ago. Right, not that long ago. You talked about a new, uh, toward a new playbook. Uh, can you uh, describe that a little bit, what that means? I think one of the reasons why democracy has been in trouble and yeah, why I talk for 17 years yeah. for 17 years and why authoritarians are gaining ground yeah. is that the authoritarians have a new story to tell a new kind of narrative it's not true but their argument is our authoritarian ways are more efficient we work better we yeah. get results for people and look at democracies. They're very messy. They're very yeah. chaotic. You know, this came up during the pandemic, right? And many people said, look at America, look at the absolute chaos, whereas in d dictatorships, we tell people what to do and they, and they do it. And we tell them to lock down in China and they do it. Well, it's not yeah. true, but it's a, shall we say, a narrative of authoritarian efficiency. What I think yeah. We should do is we need a new narrative of yeah. democracy. Democracies need to explain to people all around the world while why democracy is a better form of government. It puts the legitimacy in the hands of people and actually it allows for change. One yeah. of the things you see about autocracies, whether Cambodia or China or or Russia, is that the leaders stay in power forever. How many years was Mr. Hun Sen in power? How many years Mr. Years, Vladimir almost. Putin, Putin yeah. in power? 23 years. Now, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping, how many years will he be in power? Already into an unprecedented third term. These uh, dictatorships become very rigid. They don't yeah. change. The same people make the same 
choices. We want, I think that the democracies should start a new campaign to explain to the world the virtues and the values that are much, much better for people's way of life, standard of living. That's what we need, a new story. Right. Okay. Uh, You also mentioned uh, existing U.S. organizations such as the Freedom House, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Agency for Global Media, which broadcasts like almost 50 languages around the world, uh, the VOA, for example. Um, okay, and other uh, group, Radio Free Asia, Radio Liberty, uh, Radio Free Europe. Okay, what else do you think we could do better? We have all these existing organizations. What for yes. democracy? We have all these existing organizations and what's happened to democracy over 17 years. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think uh, people in these organizations are working very hard and they have a lot of value. I would not get rid of them, but I might ask them all to join together or create a new organization, uh, maybe not in the government, maybe a private organization that would have uh, as its goal trying to broadcast to the world a uh, more direct uh, narrative about the values of democracy and governance and to m- make sure that this idea that uh, Putin and Xi Jinping advertise that their governments are better, to make sure that it's met with a democratic point of view. Most of these agent, government agencies um, are part of what we have for many years thought of as a showcase. In other words, we advocated democracy not by boasting about it. We advocated democracy by showing it. Like, look at our democracy. And Voice of America does this very well, RFERL. You know, I think we need to now go beyond just showing it. The showcase isn't impressing enough people, maybe we need to advertise it a little better. But, okay, uh, can you tell us how to do that to achieve that goal? Well, if I had uh, all the answers, then I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be doing it. But I think um, we can see now that we have great, uh, incredibly powerful methods of communication. We can break down the firewalls. We can reach people even in places like North Korea who are isolated, but we need to find a way to explain to them how democracy works, why it is a better method of governance, the importance of putting legitimacy in the hands of people, of having competition. And I think we also need to show that some of these dictators are stealing from their own people. What we call kleptocracy is running everywhere, that they're getting themselves rich while people remain poor. And I think if we bring all these messages to bear, uh, if we can find a way to broadcast them through the digital revolution, which we are part of right now, maybe we can change the direction. Okay, do you think the US government should perhaps, you know, allocate some funds uh, Hassan, I'm not sure I'm actually not sure this should be a government effort maybe not I mean there are people who argue that the government should do this but there's enough we've had some bad experiences in the our past with the government doing this it becomes very uh, shall we say unpersuasive propaganda audiences abroad think, oh, that's just more propaganda. Maybe we need some more credible private uh, organization to do this that would really be effective, that would be devoted to causing change. And I'm not sure it should be the government. It's an argument. I I haven't decided. Right. Okay, Mr. Hoffman, I thank you very much for your time today. And uh, please come back uh, when you have time. All right. And do you want to do the introduction or do you want me to to do anything else? Can I show you my latest book, The Dead Uh, Hand? Yes, I'm going to to mention that to our audience. Yes, uh, the book is Give Me Liberty, right? It was out uh, in 
2022, you said? Yes, and this is a book about a man who fought dictatorship, who fought autocracy and paid right. with his life for it. Right. So uh, can, can can you give us a like a synopsis of, uh, you know, the, about the book? Uh, the book is about, about a man, even, yes. Yeah. The book is about a man named Oswaldo Paya. You see his picture Oswaldo on the cover Paya. here. Yeah. Uh, he was a dissident in Cuba who carried out a nonviolent campaign for democracy inside the Cuban dictatorship by asking people to sign a petition for five democratic rights, such as a free press, freedom of belief, freedom of association, free enterprise, and freedom for political prisoners. And he did this before we had uh, iPhones and uh, the digital revolution. He did this in 2000 and 2002. Anyway, this uh, petition attracted thousands and thousands of signatures. Yeah. In the end, 35,000 people signed his petition. But uh, Fidel Castro's government could not accept this. And in 2012, uh, agents of state security rammed Mr. Paya's car from behind on a country road and he was killed. Yeah. And many of his uh, supporters or, or colleagues, uh, uh, Langston. 75 of them were arrested and put given long prison terms. It was called the Black Spring of 2003. Right. Black Spring in Cuba. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, I appreciate it uh, and uh, hope to hear from you uh, again. Thank uh, you for having me. A new Hassan. book or a new article. All right, okay. thank you very much. All right, sir. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Goodbye. Good evening, Neil Desnick, John Dimitri. David Hoffman is an American author, writer, uh, on the editorial board of the Washington Post. He authored and co authored uh, many books. Uh, the latest one he just showed. Uh, is uh, Give Me Liberty, uh, where we have a slogan in New Hampshire, Give Me uh, Liberty or Death. Uh, but his book title is just Give Me Liberty. Uh, it's about uh, a struggle by a Cuban dissident uh, who at the end uh, was killed by the uh, assailant. Uh, perhaps state-supported assailant. 